NWP Radio. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. Hello, everyone. Welcome to NWP Radio. This is a broadcast of the National Writing Project. I'm Christina Cantrell, logging in from Philadelphia, and I am super excited to welcome colleagues here from the Chippewa River Writing Project, Troy Hicks and Jill Runstrom. Welcome, Troy and Jill. Thank you. I, let me give a little background here, and then each of you should introduce yourselves and also correct anything that I misstate. I believe we're here today to talk about a new book that Troy and Jill are working on, or have been working on, that's being published by NCTE. It's titled Literacies Before Technologies, Making Digital Tools Matter for Middle Grade Learners. This is one of NCTE's Principles and Practice books, which as Kathy Fleischer writes, these are books that look carefully at NCTE's research reports and policy statements, and then puts those policies to test in actual classrooms. So in this case, the position statement is the beliefs for integrating technology into the English language arts classroom that was revised by the elite commission on digital literacy and teacher ed in October, 2018, 2018. Yep. And Troy was a leading contributor. The book then takes these principles and looks at these beliefs in the context of Jill's classroom. And remarkably, given the content of the belief statement, this story begins in the spring of 2020, which was a year not to forget. So maybe to get us started here, Jill, I'm wondering if you could introduce yourself first and then take us back to that moment, you know, setting the stage for what you're sharing here and a stage that the book describes as both chaotic, but also chirotic, as in kairos. And I thought that was an interesting way to frame this moment. Well, thank you for having me. So first of all, I met Troy in 2015, I think. Uh, I've known Troy for a long time, let's just put it that way. We first met when I took a one of his shorter seminars and he and I had, we immediately had a kind of a instant connection with our love of technology. And so I then later the next summer took the Summer Institute to become a teacher consultant for the Chippewa River Writing Project. And from there, we've done quite a few different projects together and done some speaking gigs at, at different conferences. So, so he and I have had a good working relationship and I consider him a great mentor and friend of mine. So the school year the 2019-2020 school year was one of great change for me. I was working and living in Northern Michigan for a good portion of my life and had worked for 27 years in the little school district where that I called home. And in late October, early November, the opportunity presented itself for me to make a change. My husband and I had been looking to move to a bigger town. And so I had interviewed in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and was offered a position at Ann Arbor Skyline High School. I was teaching seventh grade at the time where I was. And, and so in the span of just about two months, I took a new job. My husband and I, was, we sold our home and bought a new home. And in January, 2020, I was working in, in Ann Arbor, teaching ninth grade in my new school. So yeah, so to talk, so chaotic and just wild, right? To have all of that change happen in such a short period of time. So, so there I was living alone because my husband and daughter were, were back in our little town in Northern Michigan. My daughter didn't want to leave her school until she finished up the trimester that she was in the middle of. And my husband, bless his heart, was packing up our house to move. And so I had 10 weeks. It was January, 2020. I, I got to, to work in my new school and kind of settle in for 10 weeks. And when my husband and daughter were joining me, the moving van had come at the beginning of March and they joined me on Friday, March 13th, which I don't know if, if everyone remembers all of those dates, but they're pretty significant for me. But that was when 
in Michigan, the governor had said, we're going to shut everything down. In my school district, the Ann Arbor Public Schools said, we're going to shut down for two weeks because of the coronavirus. And it, and everything just kind of spun out from there. So, and it was at that point that I had talked to Troy a couple of weeks before and he said, Hey, I'm working on this book project. You know, what do you think? I need a partner. And I had already said yes at that point. And it's from there that our talks kind of started. Wow. It's quite the story. And what a time <laughs> to be looking at your beliefs on the ways that technology gets integrated into the classroom. That's quite amazing. Troy, thank you, Jill, very much. And Troy, maybe you can introduce yourself and um, give us some more background on this, uh, this position statement and your role in working on it. Yes, thanks. So first of all, Jill, thank you for just staying signed on to this project because you could have very easily at that moment said, no, I'm good. And uh, we would have been on a totally different path, but I, I greatly appreciate your friendship and collegiality and willingness to be part of this adventure. So I'm Troy Hicks. I've been connected with the National Writing Project since I was a graduate student at Michigan State University with the Red Cedar Writing Project. And I've been the director of our Chippewa River Writing Project. I think we're getting ready to celebrate 15 years this year. So that's pretty cool. And we first started this conversation about these beliefs for integrating technology, believe it or not, way back in 2005, where one of my mentors and the director at the time of the Red Cedar Writing Project, Janet Swenson, we were all part of a group through what was then called the Conference on English Education and is now called ELATE, the English Language Arts Teacher Educators. But we met at our biannual summer conference in 2005. They were thinking about writing a statement. I wasn't actually able to be at that particular conference. And so the statement came out for the first few authors. I think there were five authors on that first one. And then there were commentaries and revisions offered over the years. Fast forward to about 2015, 2016, I think it was 2015, where we had had our, our latest and greatest summer conference. And then we said we needed to update this statement. And so then in 2017 at Ohio State, that's when the work really got underway that summer. 2018 is when the statement came out after the committee worked together. And then, of course, as Kathy contacted me and said, let's write a principles and practice book, we had this chaotic moment where suddenly all the things we were thinking about English language arts and technology were going to be put into full force with school closures and remote learning. So that kind of brings us up to the present and the collaboration that I had with Jill, which I really, really enjoyed. And I think that the book reflects just wonderfully rich and creative work that she and all her colleagues at Skyline, some of whom are Red Cedar Writing Project colleagues, were able to develop. And I'm looking forward to talking about it a bit more. Great, thank you both. That's really helpful, all that context. Yeah, I, I, reading the book, what I was struck by was really the rich, reflective work that you clearly were engaged in throughout this whole time, Jill. There's so much reflective writing throughout this book. Each chapter begins with like, seems like a journal entry of yours or something that takes us back to what you were thinking about at that moment. And then each of the chapters is just filled with all these details and student work examples and kind of things that you were trying and your reflections on that. So I was, you know, really just thinking back to the title of the book, you know, that this, you really see you thinking about this focus on literacy practices and then thinking about, okay, how do I use these tools at a distance from my kids and like, what are the things that I need to consider that maybe I wasn't quite considering in the same way before? So the example that you start with is around your digital writing notebooks, moving from you know paper notebooks to these digital notebooks is a key piece of your classroom practice. So I'd love it if you could just sort of share with us some of that, the story of that and some of your reflections about that work and your students' thoughts about it too. Sure. So to add just a little bit of additional context to that, my work during that particular year that this book was written had a, me as part of a team teaching ninth grade. I worked with three other women 
in a in a TLN group. And so we collaborated on our lesson planning and we shared the workload of trying to do this really abrupt sh shift of writing lessons together. And so what that did was it gave us the summer and and then we divided the workload. And so every fourth week, uh, it was my turn to create lessons. And so that gave me kind of like a breather to meet with Troy and talk about and be and be very intentional about what we were doing. So it gave us time to think about what what was going to go into the book and tie it into the the, um, the position statement. And, uh, and our first conversations over that summer uh, really centered around uh, writer's notebooks. Like what's the benefit of the paper, pencil, old fashioned, you know, marble, black and white notebooks, and how might we have some of those things transfer digitally or, and then, then that went into well, what are the advantages of having something that's digital in nature and how might that tie into the position statement, the principles and practice statement. And so what, what we came up with is we started talking about what, what were the advantages of doing it digitally and, and Ann Arbor Public Schools actually provided me with templates that I could work with. And, and what I ended up choosing was a Google Slides template, and that was intentional. And I thought about experimenting with some of the things because of uh, using slides because it had more functionality. So students could use, they could not only write in it just like they did the regular notebooks, but they also had the capability of some, a little bit of graphic design. They also could import pictures and video and so there were, there were some cool things that they could do with it. When you think about the principles and practice statement, it helped students, like students that have a 504 or an IEP statement, they could very easily take notes. You know, if you think about a traditional classroom where you might have something projected on the board and you ask students to take notes, students that have, you know, verbal processing issues or handwriting, you know, manual dexterity issues, they are often left behind trying desperately to write things down by hand. When you do a digital writer's notebook and they have access to my teacher slides, which they did, they could copy and paste into their uh, writer's notebook. Or if they felt like they just wanted to sit and listen, they could go back after the lesson was over and make those those transfers after the lesson was over. They could choose to do that on their own. So they had some autonomy over their learning and their learning style, which was really cool for them. And then just something simple like a writer's notebook prompt. If you ask students to do a writing prompt, one that I remember pretty vividly, it was a gorgeous fall day here in Ann Arbor. And I told the students, I said, just go outside, get, get away from the screen, take your phones and go outside and take a picture, go with your pet, take a video and take 20 minutes and do this and then come back and upload it onto your Google slide and then write for 10 minutes. Well, you know, a traditional marble notebook doesn't allow you the, the ability to do that. So the the digital writer's notebook extends a student's capability to do things with writing that that you can't do with a traditional writer's notebook. So we, I really tried to plan things that made made those extensions and provided those opportunities and and gateways into the learning to level the playing field for students and to give them things to that they could do that they couldn't do with the traditional notebook. So a lot of our talking centered around how might we set that up and what might that look like for a student. That's great. I love the example too of how you can, you know, leave it and go somewhere and then transfer content, you know, like the going outside and, you know, using a mobile, other mobile technologies to bring in other resources into your notebook. It makes the notebook, you know, a much more sort of multimodal kind of experience overall. Thank you for that example. It's great. 
I know you, there, there are several other work that you did in the similar way throughout here, there was an example that was sort of connected to argument writing and sort of the work of C3WP. And it might that story might be interesting too to some of our writing project colleagues who are listening here. Yeah, I can set the frame for that. I just wanted to make one comment on Jill's story about the, the use of the smartphones outside. Again, it's no secret that our students are using these devices, right? They are on all kinds of social media. They're putting on filters. They're now interacting with AI chatbots, all kinds of wonderful things. But even in just her kind of pivoting of that move of here, I want you to take your phone and do something intentional in this way in kind of a schooly way, but in a good way, right? More so than just, oh, I'm going to jump on my phone and post something to social media. This is part of my larger writing practice that, I, that I've been carrying on throughout our course. And then also to invite them just to go into a different space outside in this case and getting them to think about that device that's in their pocket or their purse or their backpack and to use it uh, with a slightly more creative, critical lens. And, and I think that's part of what Jill uh, does really well. So yeah. So, so Troy, let me cut you. I just wanted to say that this is just like what the book is like for the listeners, is that Jill and Troy do this back and forth. It's a very lovely and has, you know, all these sort of reflective thoughts within them that are very, very helpful in thinking about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So anyway, I just wanted to highlight that. So thank you, Troy. <laughs> oh, well, and... Thank you for noting that, Chris. And then also thanks to Kathy Fleischer for inviting us to write it in that way. The book really does take Jill's voice in the first person, even though it was collaboratively co-authored. We stuck with her first person voice throughout the main parts of the text. And then it's interspersed with a number of vignettes from other educators and writing project colleagues included. And then I would periodically come in and, and drop these little notes from Troy. And that was all at the suggestion of Kathy Fleischer. So I've got to give credit to a wonderful writing project a colleague and a wonderful editor. But yeah, to that point about the C3WP and the argument, and I know Jill can explain this in much more detail, we started talking through and thinking about that unit that was ultimately going to be this parallel process of creating an infographic while also creating an argument essay. And it became really interesting for us to keep moving back and forth, thinking about, all right, what does a thesis look like in text, you know, with words and sentences and sentences and paragraphs and paragraphs and essays? But then what does that look like visually? what gets put into that visual, what doesn't get put into that visual, what gets represented in a different way. And uh, again, I think it really centered that idea of literacies before technologies. We wanted to think about those literacy practices and how they were transferring across both the written word and the visual design. So yeah, I'll be really eager to hear Jill talk a bit more about how she felt going through that infographic development project. So as we planned that unit, the my my planning team, my my freshman teacher team, we talked about what might we do that was engaging, and we actually leaned on one of the elementary text sets. So what's cool about the argument materials that the C3WP has is that they can work they can work across all grade levels. So we picked, there's a text set about eating bugs that that's really fun and engaging. And so that's what we thought would be great to use. And so, you know, I found open source images of bugs and, you know, like put them all over the slides and, and that, that was fun. But what we did is we, because we were limited with the amount of time and because we couldn't be with the kids in the room, we had to find a way to, uh, to get them. We wanted them to do a couple of rounds of argument. And so we just used the same text set and we, we had them do two different things. We had them create an infographic and then we had them write an essay. And what was really interesting was the, the dialogue that we had as teachers together, you know, kind of a, a the chicken and the egg kind of thing was, should we have them write the essay first and then make the infographic or should we have them 
create an infographic first and then write an essay from it. And what we decided was, is we would try doing the infographic first and then have the students take that and make it, create an essay. So they used the exact same sources, the same material, the same claim, and, and they created two different things from it. And, uh, and then in the student reflections afterwards, we asked them the same question. Would you have preferred doing it in the, in the opposite order or did you like doing it this way? And that was also interesting because the reviews were mixed. So I really think it's all about learning style and what kids are comfortable with but developing that digital literacy of deciding like what what should be a visual picture, what can be represented in data that doesn't need to be said in words, and and how might a, a person's eye move through an infographic is is a really important skill because so much of what we consume daily on our especially on our on our smartphones is, digital in nature in pictures. So students need to know how to create that. They shouldn't just be consumers of it. They need to know how to, how to make it. And so that was a really important, important assignment for them. And Troy and I talked very, we, we went back and forth a lot about that too, that the students shouldn't just be taking icons and, you know, little pictures and, you know, putting them on their, on their infographic, like they need to take a data and create a pie chart or a bar graph and they need to understand like what that data represents and be able to to write about it and it's not it shouldn't just be you know some of this pre-made stuff and so we worked at that too like what might you what data might you collect and what could you create to represent that data and that was also a really important skill I sometimes like to refer to that as putting the info in the infographics, because again, we, we've joked a little bit that, yeah, you can, you can log on to Canva or to PictoChart or Infogram or something like that and use all the fun icons and color schemes and themes and templates and things like that. But it, it's that numeracy piece that you just alluded to, Jill, that I think really drives it home. So they're suddenly seeing, oh, this is not just another fancy tech tool that I'm taking my argument paper. I actually have to put some data in here and manipulate it and think about what that's going to look like and how that's going to bolster my argument. And so it becomes a multidimensional, truly digitally literate approach that you're, you're bringing all these literacies and numeracy skills together. Yeah, that's a wonderful example. And it does speak to the, the belief, the, is it belief number one? Literacy means literacies, right? That there's, you know, multiple literacies embedded in this work. It's great example. Thank you. So I wanted to sort of think about sort of what you've brought forward, because these examples really interrogate what you were doing and what you were thinking about. And I love, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up like how you're working with your, your colleagues too during this time, because I think that's really critical. And it, it sounds like you were able to sort of reimagine how to work together, but also reimagine some of the ways you worked with your students. You talked about, you know, really even changing kind of how you thought about your relationship to them and how you engage with them and your assessment practices even, like some of the sort of core fundamental pieces of your work change quite dramatically. So I'd love to hear about sort of what you, you know, sort of take, continue to take forward from that time and from this exploration of your practice as well as some of what you left behind. I mean, it was clear that you, or my sense from the book is that your principal was very supportive of like, okay, we're not gonna go into the, when we return to the building, we're not gonna just do things as we normally did. Life has changed quite a bit. So it sounds like you were in a supportive environment in many ways to really think about, okay, what do I wanna take forward? So I'd love to hear you, I don't know, you can unpack that if you want, cause I'm sure it's more complicated than that, but I'd love to hear sort of, what you're what you're bringing into your current teaching. One thing that I would say that was really interesting, and I'm still talking with my students about it now, is 
this whole idea of connection and conversation, Mm -hmm. I feel like students have, they've really kind of lost what that means because of our year of school online. I, I feel like we've kind of gotten over the hump now of students sending me an email while they're in class with me. They know that they can actually come and speak to me while they're in class, but we're doing some discussions in class now, discussing through argument, discussing through analysis, and and one of our, our units that we have to cover, our mastery standards that we have to cover is speaking and listening. And so I'm at, so one of the things I have asked students is we're doing the spider web discussion protocol. And if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's the, the premise is that the, the entire class gets one grade based on everyone participating in the discussion. And so my question to them was, what does it mean to fully participate in a discussion? And so they had all kinds of interesting things that they thought about that. And what I told them was, I kind of, in a strange way, miss Zoom for discussion because I think one of the, the, the most compelling vignettes that I wrote in that book was the vignette about discussing literature, the literature circles that we that that we did that year. And it was it sur- it was about a student who is neurodiverse. He and I still have him. I've had him for three years as an English student and he will not speak in class. He'll talk to me, but if we have a, a discussion in class, even if I were to say to him, I and his name in the book is Ben, that's not his name, but that's the name that we give him. If I were to say, Ben, uh, what do you think? He would sit there in class and he wouldn't say anything. And, and and it's because he's processing, but it's just so uncomfortable for him. And because of his disability, it it's just too hard for him to actually speak aloud in class. But when he was put in a small group and put into a, a Zoom breakout room, and he had a supportive group that wanted that helped him. He could leave his camera off, he could mute his microphone, and he could type in the chat what he wanted to say. And the group, the discussion leader, would read what he had to say, and he was part of the discussion. And I think that was one of the more unexpected things that happened, that I really wish there was a way to recreate that back in in-person school. I don't think there is, but that was like one of the most heartwarming, cool things that happened to me as an online teacher during that year. So we're still trying to like tease out some of that cool stuff that happened and keep it and hold on to it. Some of it, I don't think we can. And then, and then there's some of the aftermath of that we're trying to figure out. And a lot of it has to do for me anyway, with balance. Um, we had all that like intense online. Now we're back in school and I, and I feel like students don't really want to go back to anything that was what we would term traditional schooling. So they want to have earbuds in, they want to use their phones all the time. They want to have their devices and they don't really want to like put that down for a moment and just listen (laughs) and talk to each other face to face, they don't, they don't really want to do that. And so it's kind of like, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's like try to figure out like what's good about what we left behind and what's good about what was traditional and figure out how to put those two together. Because there were some parts to traditional school that were good, but I feel like we're at this, this really intense tipping point in education that needs to be addressed. I'm not sure how to do it. But I hope that the people who are decision makers do something about it because I feel like our students need it. They really, really do. And teachers do too. I was wondering if you wanted to add anything to that. It strikes me that 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 balance is something that I'm sure you yourself as an educator and a teacher and a writing project director often thinking about too and where 
I don't know, maybe we can meditate a little bit. On, like, how do, how do we seek this balance or how do we get this balance that we seek? Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking about the conversations that Jill and I had had about Ben back when we were doing the writing. And then I was thinking about this phrase that I, I, I kind of use it in different ways at different times, but for better or for worse, schools are actually pretty good at doing the things they're designed to do. And depending on the context of the conversation, that can have multiple meanings. And when I talk about that with students, oh yeah, well, yeah, we do graduate most people and they're doing that. Yes, but what are schools really designed to do? And then we get to these deeper, more critical questions. And so I think that, you know, whatever stage we're at, you know, with with learning and the status of remote learning, and we'll probably have seasonal mini epidemics of, of course, the flu and RSV and COVID and whatever. And I know Jill's school went into a situation where they were asking students to mask after the holidays again to help cut down on RSV. And we saw all the blow up that came of that. I, I just think that it's going to be incredibly interesting to just think about how best, you know, here we have a student who in the classroom is having this particular struggle, but online was able to flourish. But then how can we do, how can we do the both and rather than the either or? And, and I don't know that there's ever a good answer for that. And especially when you're dealing with 150 personalities every day and making the thousands of decisions that Jill and her colleagues in the K-12 classroom are making. My brain is not in that space every day, so I can't even fully appreciate it. I kind of remember it from when I was in the classroom, and I, and I can have those conversations with my colleagues like Jill. But all of that to say, as we're then thinking about layering on the digital literacies, my hope would be that we are inviting kids to create and to use their devices in these productive ways. And yes, we all got really good at Google Classroom or Schoology or Blackboard or Canvas. Yep, we all got really good at setting up breakout rooms in Zoom. And yep, we all got really good at you know creating quizzes and Google Forms and whatever. But hopefully the lessons we take from remote learning and teaching are that we can put kids in that creative role and giving them opportunities to do things that are much more generative than what we might have given them opportunity or or license to do in the past lovely that's great thank you i want to move into sort of some sort of open final thoughts but i also want to not forget to bring up ai and you know the sort of like new frontiers that keep opening up in technology and in learning and in teaching and the complications of them as they do. So we're a few months into these conversations about AI and GPT chat and all of that. I know, Jill, you've been experimenting a bit with your students and talking to them about it. I'd love to hear sort of how you're bringing these kind of beliefs and practice or principles into your practice around some of that work too. So I can just give you a little bit of context around an assignment my students are currently doing. Right now, I'm teaching English 11, so not middle grades, but this this assignment certainly could be done middle grades on up. And I guess before I even tell you the nitty gritty of the assignment, I would say my mindset and philosophy about new technologies has always been one of, I've never been one to fear it or to think that it's something that is bad or cheating, or I, I always think of a new technology as, well, okay, this is the latest thing. Let's figure it out. And how might we best utilize it for the common good? Because I, I feel like a lot of people, like some of the sentiment around, especially AI and chat GPT in particular is that, oh, the, you know, the students are just going to and that's the end of, you know, of writing, you know, students are just going to use chat GPT to write their papers. And so I don't think that at all. Like, I think what teachers need to be mindful of, at least this teacher talking to you right now is I think, okay, let's figure out what does it, what can it do? What are its pitfalls and how my, how my I write assignments that utilize it that are interesting for the students. So my most recent thing that they're doing is analysis. 
And so what I'm having them do is they have a choice of what they want to analyze, movie, TV show, sports, a piece of art, or what's the other thing? I'm drawing a blank. Music. Did I say music? You get the idea. So they pick something that they like. Yeah. And then they, and we've done quite a bit of skills practice leading into this with little bits that I've, they've practice, I've mentored things for them. And then they've written a prompt and put it into chat GBT. Write me a 750 word analysis essay on, you know, why Kendrick Lamar's album to pimp a butterfly is, is the most culturally impactful. You know, I think that it was, I did something like that for them to mentor what it might look like. A lot of students hadn't seen chat GPT. So I'm doing this on the board for them. And I'm talking while the thing is writing this. And some of the kids are like, oh. you know, they have no idea. It's, it's mind blowing when you first see it, right? It's really cool. But leading into it though, we talked about rhetorical devices and what what good analysis looks like. And, and I'd had them, you know, pick a mentor text and, you know, like from the Atlantic or from NPR or from, you know, it's good writing. And they picked out like, oh, I really like this. I want to try this in my, in my analysis. And I want to do this in my analysis. So they already had like four or five things as a writer that they wanted to try. And so as chat GPT is writing this, I'm talking through like, okay, I remember I picked out in my article that I wanted to do this and I wanted to do this and I wanted to do this. And I said, so I'm going to be looking for those things in this, in this piece. And I'm also going to be looking for like, what's not accurate. What? And so then once it was done composing from my prompt, then we, we analyzed the analysis piece that, that chat GPT wrote for me and we picked it apart and like it wrote, it, it cut off like mid sentence at the end. Like, what's that all about? And the kids are like, well, it was probably the 750th word. Unless we did a word count, 637 words. So it was fascinating, right? Like, so I, the kids really learned a whole bunch that chat GPT just on its own doesn't do the job. And so it is not going to kill writing assignments it might provide like a nice beginning a scaffold maybe maybe some good sentence structure here and there but what my students are learning right now is that yeah, it's not bad but it certainly doesn't have any voice in it it doesn't have some of the really good writing things in terms of rhetoric that we talked about so hopefully they're learning that it's not a great tool and you certainly shouldn't think that that's going to be, you know, the night before something's due that you're going to use that to cheat. That's a really bad idea. And then we also have had the conversation, like, is this, is this ethical? And some of them think, no, I said, even if I've assigned it, I've told you that you should use it. It's still not ethical. And some of them are like, nope, not ethical. So it's fascinating. It's really a fascinating thing. So, and then other kids say, it's not going away which I, and in my mind, I'm thinking, yep, you're right about that. It's not going away. So how are we going to use it and move forward with it in a way that's, that's educational? So that's digital literacy to me. Yeah, I love those conversations. Thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that to say, kudos to you. Certainly you're spending more time in the instructional moment of walking them through that and really modeling that process and having pro and con, good and bad conversations about the writing itself, as well as the ethics of what we'll, we'll gener generously call co-authoring with the AI writing tools. And I think there's a whole other brand of tools beyond chat gpt and bard from google and you have tools like jasper and copy.ai and writer and all these other tools that are intentionally designed and and marketed to marketers so we'll help you write your social media your blogs your video scripts your grant proposals your emails and that allows you to pick tone and style. And there's a whole bunch of other conversations that you can then have about the rhetorical devices and so forth. 
The other piece I'll put on this, and I'm not quite the one to talk about this. There are other scholars that are doing much better work around this because it's their area of expertise, but just that critical perspective, asking the critical questions of the technologies, the large language models, and, and the good and bad that come of that. And unfortunately, with the, the large language models being drawn from the whole of the internet, and we know that the internet is unfortunately kind of a sexist, racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, and all kinds of other terrible things place. We have to be really mindful of the output that these AIs are generating and then how we're asking our students to analyze and use and respond to those those outputs. And so then, and we barely hinted at it at the end, the profit motive that's underlying all of this technology too. So there are really great scholars that are asking lots of questions. Neil Selwyn is one from Australia. I know Amy Coe from the University of Washington. The folks at the Civics of Technology are asking these types of questions. And I'm sure many others that I'm not even able to mention right now. So I would just encourage us to keep thinking critically and carefully as well as creatively about the AI tools. And again, putting those literacy skills before getting caught up in the technology bells and whistles. Great. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I really appreciate the sort of inquiries into ethical practices and ethics that, that like that kind of conversation about these tools too. I wonder about the media literacy like what are, what are the, some of the media literacy questions we need to ask also as we explore them and 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 how can we you know engage young people in really thinking i mean we're all completely you know either wowed or floored or terrified by this technology at the same time you know <laughs> like we're not you know this is definitely a clear place that we need to do some shared inquiry together. So I think that that's really powerful. And I, I do think that these conversations that can include scholars who are really bringing expertise into this practice with teachers, with students, those are really powerful spaces to co-create together. So I'd love to look for more opportunities to do that with you all as we go here. So I just wanted to bring us to sort of a final, a round of sort of final thoughts as to sort of wrap up this NWP radio show. And, you know, one of my takeaways from going through the book was just the, was exactly this, this sort of dialogue that, that is necessary in all of this work that, that there's not a clear answer. It's not like, oh, just do this or just do that. Or, you know, it's, it's not it's not simple or, you know, these are complicated ideas. So the, the more we can talk with our colleagues, the more we can talk uh, across K through 16, the more we can talk with our students, the more we can do our own, have time to do our own self-reflection and sort of inquiry into our work. Anyway, that's what I took away from the book. I felt like, you know, it was very much a book about dialogue and about inquiry and about colleagueship, I think. And I hope that, and it's just packed full of resources. So anyway, before we leave, you should tell us about the resources that are also online related to this book, but let, let me open it for final thoughts and then we can talk about where people can find additional resources. Jill, would you like to share final thoughts first? <laughs> sure, I would just say that I'm super grateful that I got the opportunity to have this experience, to have my weekly conversations with Troy. It was, it was a lot of, of work, but it was, it was a labor of, of just great thought, you know, I, in as much as the pandemic in so many ways outside of my, my little world was, was really a very difficult time in our worlds because of the virus, because of so many other things that were impactful that were going on at that time. For me, in my teacher life, it was probably the greatest gift that was given to me in terms of the way that the school district that I worked for structured the day, the wonderful people that I was that I was gifted to work with and the way that we were able to, to be collegial with each other. We have a very strong bond still with one another. And, and so it was just really a great time 
that we got to slow down and really spend time and talk and think about our work. And that is something that just doesn't happen in public ed. Like it's such a fast paced, solitary profession in so many ways. So it was, it was a really, really great thing to do. And, and I'm just grateful, grateful that I got the chance to do it. Thank you, Jill. And I really appreciate that we took that time as well. And you're right. We we have to make the time rather than saying we're going to get the time. And so just to know that you continue those conversations with your colleagues at Skyline High School and the other writing project colleagues around the country are continuing to have those kinds of collegial conversations and partnerships, I think is super important. So yeah, we do have a list of the the resources as they were when we submitted the the publication a few months ago that will be available on my website, hickstro.org. There will be a QR code and a bit.ly short link and things like that. But if you search for my website, you'll be able to click on the books tab and then click on the literacies before technology page from there to find all the links as present in the book at the time of publication. I know that link rot is a thing now that I'm, (laughs) you know, two decades into this and looking back at some of my previous work. And I know that some of those sites are long gone, but at the very least, it will be present there for people. If they don't have opportunity to pick up the book, they can still click onto the website and get all the links to the resources. That's great. Thank you. And let me just say that And I know you said this, but I wanted to make it clear that the book also does, you, both of you invited other colleagues to submit stories about their classroom practice to the book too. So that's another super exciting layer in there are these other middle school educators stories of, of their practice and putting these principles into, into practice basically. So, so thank you both so much for you know, making that time to do this work, first of all, <laughs> and and then sharing it with all of us in this way. And, and then I so appreciate you coming here to NWP Radio and being able to, you know, talk about where you are now and sort of where you're hoping to go with all of this. So thank you so much. This has been a production of the National Writing Project. It's NWP Radio, and you'll find more episodes at nwp.org. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to NWP Radio, a production of the National Writing Project. NWP. NWP Radio.